What's up guys? Welcome to our next video on limits. So I know that uh, last video with the properties of limits was a bit of a doozy, so we're going to take back and we're going to relax a little bit and we're just going to prove three limits today. And uh, while these limits may seem intuitive, um, you have to go through and you have to prove that each limit is in fact what we think it is. And even though it ends up um, being what you think it is, it's not quite as simple as plugging in the numbers. You have to actually go through and rigorously prove that these limits do exist. Um, but the good news is that the proofs are relatively uncomplicated. They're not convoluted as you may think, maybe just a little, but you get past it real quick. So the three limits are the limit as x approaches c of b is equal to b, the limit as x approaches c of x is equal to c, and finally the limit as x approaches c of x to the n is equal to c to the n where n is a positive integer. So we're just going to jump right in. We're going to prove this first part. But before we prove this first part, keep in mind that whenever we're proving a limit, well, here, the limit as x approaches c of f of x is equal to l. This limit exists um, when uh, for any epsilon value greater than zero, there is some delta value also greater than zero, such that if zero is less than the absolute value of x minus c is less than delta, then absolute value of f of x minus c, my, pardon me, minus l is less than epsilon. So. Uh, basically, your whole goal in um, proving, in order to prove that this limit exists, you have to say that when x falls within um, uh, delta of c, then that means f of x falls within epsilon of l. So um, your entire goal is basically to say that when this statement is true, this statement is also true. So now we have to apply this to our actual situation. So we have f of x being b, and we have l being b. So, um, in order to prove that this limit exists, we have to go through and prove that these two statements uh, also are true. So, we go through and we apply it to our specific situation. So, we have to prove that for any epsilon greater than zero, there is a delta value such that when this statement is true, when the absolute value of x minus c greater than zero but less than delta, if to, uh, when that statement is true, then um, b minus b is less than epsilon. However, you'll notice that this is actually quite simple. This can be simplified to zero is less than epsilon or epsilon greater than zero. And we'll just put in more familiar terms there. So, this actually proves uh, that the limit exists because this statement is always true as it was a part of our given. So again, to reiterate, whenever x falls within delta units of c, b will always fall within epsilon units of b, which makes sense because b is in fact b, so there's like no distance between them. And um, as long as epsilon is always greater than zero, it will always be greater than the distance between um, f of x and l. So, um, whenever this statement is true, this statement is also true, because it is always true, because epsilon has to be greater than zero. So, that one was uh, fairly simple, um, and now we're gonna get into it, and it's gonna be a little bit more complicated. Uh, we're going to go back to, um, now we're going to go and prove that the limit as x approaches uh, c of x is just equal to c. But again, we'll go back to our general form here. So, uh, again, in order to prove that a limit exists, we have to prove that when x is within delta units of c, f of x is within epsilon units of l. So, now we just have to apply our specific uh, constraints to the general uh, epsilon delta definition. So, 
Our goal is to prove that for any epsilon greater than zero, uh, there is a delta greater than zero such that when x, uh, when the absolute value of x uh, minus c falls between zero and delta, we have to prove that x minus c is always less than epsilon. But you'll notice that these two similars are in fact, these, these two inequalities are in fact very similar. As a matter of fact, the only thing that's really different are these two. So, how do we make them the same? Because the whole point is that if this, we're trying to prove that if this is true, then this is always true. So, in order to make this statement true, we would set delta equal to epsilon. So, by doing that, then we're saying that if this statement is true, this statement is always true, which, of course, makes sense because they are the same statement. So, if this is true, then this has to be true because they are equal. And an example for this is that, let's start over from the beginning real quick. And let's just say you give me an epsilon value of 0.1. So I have to find a delta value such that um, the f of x value will fall within 0.1 units of uh, L, our L value. Well, um, in order to find that delta value, in order for this um, uh, thing to be true, we have to set delta equal to epsilon. So we would set delta equal to 0 0.1. So this is saying that when x is within 0 0.01 units of c, then f of x is within 0 0.01 units of l, which is what we intended to prove. So um, by setting the uh, delta equal to epsilon, a very important thing in this proof, we've uh, shown that these two inequalities are the same, and because uh, um, they are the same, we can say that this one is true whenever this one is true. So that was our second limit, and now for the final limit, it actually becomes much simpler than all of those. Oop, whoops, I can actually make this simpler. So our final limit is that we're trying to prove that the limit as x approaches c of x to the n is equal to c to the n, where n is some positive integer. Now, this may sort of sound complicated as first, but we did actually most of the groundwork in the previous video. And we're going to use a property of limits known as the power rule. And so, or the power property, rather. So, according to the power property, if the limit as x approaches c of f of x is equal to l, then the limit as x approaches c of f of x to the n is equal to l to the n, where again, n is some positive integer. So here's the general form of the power property, and we actually find that this limit is actually just a specific case of this, pro uh, of this power property. And it's just a specific case in that we set um, f of x equal to x. So when we set f of x equal to x, we can actually change this by making it x. And in the pre and in the previous limit, not that just a few minutes ago, we proved that the limit as x approaches c of x is equal to c. So f of x is equal to x and l is equal to c. So then by the power property, we can say that the limit as x approaches c of x to the n is just equal to c to the n. So that one's a bit less complicated, but hopefully you're able to understand all three. Definitely watch over the videos if they don't make sense because these are really important limits to know. They may seem basic and intuitive, but you really have to understand why they are what they are.